Sponsored by Rabbi Shlemi and Mirla Greenwald. This is a sicha from Lakota Sichas, Chilak Tazayan Parshas Kisisa Sicha Beis. And the topic of the sicha is that in this week's parsha, we learn about the making of the Shem and Hamishcha, and we learn a teaching of Rashi on the word Hin, which is the measurement of the amount of oil that was in the Shem and Hamishcha. And there are three parts in the sicha. The Rebbe will, number one, ask five questions on Rashi. Number two, present the key that will lead to answering all the questions. And number three, expound on one of the points in the answer. In our parsha by the tzivoy, the command for making the Shemana Mishcha, so it says in the Pasuk, and this is after the Pasuk and the Pesukim describe all the types of spices and roots that were needed for the Shemana Mishcha in order that they should have a good smell and taste. So after all of this, the Pasuk says to use the Shemen Zayis Hin, a, a hin of olive oil. So Rashi quotes the word hin, and he explains what's a hin. It's yud Bez Lugin, and a leg is a measurement that's around 12 ounces. And then Rashi continues and says, Yisrael. The Chacham Yisrael argue about this. Rabbi Meir, Aimer, Rabbi Meir says, shalku And these 12 Lug of Shemen Zayis, they cooked, shalku is to cook even more than regular cooking, they overcooked the roots and the spices. Rashi continues, Omer le Rabbi Yehuda, Rabbi Yehuda said to Rabbi Meir, Va'arei Twelve lug of oil is not even enough to just smear on the roots. By just smearing it on the roots, it would get fully absorbed into them. Rather, what they did is they first immersed all the roots and all the spices in water in order that they should absorb the water and no longer have any space to absorb the oil. Afterwards, they placed the oil on the roots until the oil absorbed and took in the smell of these roots and spices. And then they gathered the oil from upon these roots. And there are four questions here. And as we'll see, that we're going to answer one of the questions, and that'll actually bring up a fifth question. The first question is, we have to understand, the way of Rashi is that if he's going to teach two things on one pasuk, or even on one word, then he separates them into two teachings. And so if that's the case, why does Rashi combine two teachings in this one Rashi? He teaches over here on the word Hin, both that it's Yudbeis Lugan, as well as that there's an argument among the Chachmei Yisrael how the Shemana Mishcha was made. And this question is especially strong since Rashi says, V'nech l'kubay, with a Vava Maisif, in direct continuation to saying Yudbeis Lugan, he says, V'nech l'kubay, as a continuation to it. And also he says, Boy, in the Yudbeis Lugan that we just spoke about, Shoku is, what they, is, is where they cooked and overcooked the spices and the roots. So he's saying it, that he's referring to the beginning of that very Rashi. And he doesn't do it on the next Pasuk where it actually says, Va'asisa, that you should make it. Va'asisa, Eisei, Shem, and Mishchas Kedesh. So we have to understand, why does Rashi put these two teachings together? The second question is, and the second, third, and fourth questions are the Yukim and Rashi. So the second question is, Rashi begins, before he presents the argument of Rabbi Meir and Rabbi Yehuda, he begins by saying, He tells us first that there's an argument. So now it makes sense why Rashi starts by saying that there's an argument, and he doesn't start right away by presenting the two opinions, since that's in order to teach that both opinions are equal. Because if Rashi has two explanations on something, and one is better than the other, he brings the better one first. Now, what does Rashi do if they're both equal? What he does is he starts off by saying there are two opinions, meaning to say there are two opinions, and both of them are equal. So it's understood why Rashi begins by saying that there's an argument in this matter. It's in order to teach us that both opinions of Rabbi Meir and Rabbi Huda are equal. However, the question is, why does Rashi say, V'nech l'kubay, chach me Yisrael? That's not the regular terminology that Rashi uses. Usually Rashi uses something like Rabbi Seinu. That's what he usually says. So why does he say over here, V'nech l'kubay, chach me Yisrael? The second question is, why does Rashi say the names of Rabbi Meir and Rabbi Huda? And he doesn't just say there are two different explanations. And like we explained many times, 
that when Rashi brings the names of the opinions, it's in order to add understanding to his teaching. So how does that, how do the names of Rabbi and Rabbi Yehuda add to our understanding of Rashi's teaching over here? And the fourth question is, and this is really just strengthening the third question, that we find in the Gemara Bavli that the first opinion that Rashi says is the opinion of Rabbi Meir, the Bavli says that's actually the opinion of Rabbi Yehuda. And what Rashi says is the opinion of Rabbi Yehuda, the Bavli says is actually the opinion of Rabbi Yesi. This way that Rashi presents it, that the first opinion is Rabbi Meir and the second one is Rabbi Yehuda, is what's found in the Yerushalmi. So the question becomes strengthened. We see Rashi saying the names over here, and he's not just telling us the names, which is not the norm, unless there's something to teach us with it. He's specifically choosing to present it in this way, that the first opinion is Rabbi Meir, and the second one is Rabbi Yehuda, and not that the first is Rabbi Yehuda, and the second one is Rabbi Yesi. So that emphasizes even more, and it stands out even more, that Rashi is telling us the names, and specifically in this way. And so we have to understand, what is it teaching us by saying the names and it's the names of Rabbi Meir specifically as the first opinion and Rabbi Huda as the second opinion. So now regarding the first question about why does Rashi combine these two teachings into one Dibra Maschol, so L'cha'era we can answer very simply that once Rashi tells us that a hin was only yud based looking of oil, so it's now difficult. There's a difficulty that comes up right when we learn that a hin is yud based lugan. And the difficulty is that this is a very small amount of oil compared to the spices and roots. And so how is it possible that there should remain enough oil after they put it together with the spices and roots? How is it possible that there should remain enough oil for the mishchas kaidish and enough for everything that had to be done with it? Umashach the bayas ha'el they had to use it on the el moed, on the kalim, on the kehanim. And so... Because Rashi's first teaching, that it was Yud-Bez Lugan, brings up this question, so therefore he has to immediately continue and address the question, and he does so by presenting the two opinions about how the Shemana Mishcha was made. And that's why it's a one Dibra Maschal, because it's his first teaching that brings up the question that now has to be addressed. However, it's still not understood, because this question is L'Chaira only answered according to Rabbi Yehuda, who explains that they first soaked the spices and roots with water so they absorbed water and they didn't absorb the oil so that's how there was oil for the shaman mishcha however according to rabbi Meir, the question remains and this is exactly actually the question of rabbi Yehuda on rabbi Meir. his question on rabbi Meir was that if you're going to place the oil on the spices and roots then it's going to absorb all the oil and there won't be any oil that remains so we understand why Rashi combines these two teachings, because once he tells us the measurement of a hin, we have a question that needs to be addressed. But it seems that the question is only being addressed and answered by Rabbi Huda and not by Rabbi Meir. And this point actually brings us to the great question on this Rashi. And that is, Rashi begins by telling us the opinion of Rabbi Meir, that by Shalkosayikarin, that they cooked and overcooked the spices and roots in this shemen, in this oil. And then immediately afterwards he presents the question of Rabbi Huda, which is Vale Losakasayikarin in a sipic. There's not even enough oil to smear on the roots and spices without it getting fully absorbed. And Rashi does this without giving us any answer to the question of Rabbi Huda. And so there's a difficulty on the answer of Rabbi Meir. He's presenting the answer of Rabbi Meir to tell us how would Yud Beis Lugan be enough, and it doesn't even answer it, as Rabbi Yehuda asks on him. And this question is especially difficult since Rashi begins by saying, which as we explained earlier, that when Rashi tells us that there's an argument before he presents it, it means that both answers are equally good. Both explanations for how Yud Beis Lugan were enough are equally good. Meanwhile, we look at it, and it seems that Rabbi Meir's explanation and answer is completely not understood because the, the question is, is there on Rabbi Meir. How was Yud Beis Lugan enough? It would actually get fully absorbed if they placed it directly onto the roots and the spices without first soaking it in water. Now in the Gemara, and the Gemara Bavli, this question is actually answered. Because 
in the Bavli, the opinions are reversed. Rabbi Yesi asked the question on Rabbi and Rabbi Yehuda responds, Was there only one miracle that occurred with the Shem and Lugan. But we see that it started off as just Yudbeis Lugan. And from that, those Yudbeis Lugan, they were able to be to anoint the Mishkan, the Kalim, Aaron, his sons, the Kulukayim Lavi. And in addition, all of it remains complete for Lasid Lavi. So the answer basically is that by the making of the Shemana Mishcha, it was done in a miraculous way. So we could say also over here, it would seem that that's the opinion and the explanation of the opinion of Rabbi Meir, that it was indeed a miracle that Yudbeis Lugan was enough. However, we're not able to learn that this is what Rashi means and how he understands the opinion of Rabbi Meir, that it was done through a miracle, because there's no mention or even hint of this in Rashi, so it's clearly not how he understands the opinion of Rabbi Meir. And in addition, from the fact that later Rashi says, it says in the Pasuk there, that it will be Lederi Seichem, so Rashi says, Mikan, from here, where it says Lederi Seichem, Lamdu Rabbi Seinu, Rabbi Seinu learned, Shekulei Kaim La'asad Lavi, that all of it is there, La'asad Lavi. So from the fact that Rashi says Mikan, that we only have an inkling of this or insight of this, or we learn this, indicates that until this Pasuk, till we learn this Pasuk, where it says Lader Yisechem, we don't have to say that there was any type of miracle with the Shem and HaMeshcha. So clearly this is not how Rashi understands the opinion of Rabbi Meir, that it was done through an S. Now this question itself forces us to say, that according to Rashi, this is not even a question on Rabbi Meir. There's no question on Rabbi Meir that there's not even enough oil to smear on the roots without it getting fully absorbed. Because if it is a question, then how does Rashi present to us the opinion of Rabbi Meir? And he even tells us that it's as equal and as good as the opinion of Rabbi Yehuda. So Rashi tells us it's Yud Beis Lugan, that's the measurement. And then there's a difficulty, how is that enough? He presents to us the opinion of Rabbi Meir that there's a great difficulty in it. Obviously, Rashi holds that this is not a question according to the opinion of Rabbi Meir. But that brings up two questions for us. Number one, it actually seems to be a very good question. When you learn the Pesukim simply, this seems to be a good question. Yud Beis Lugan is not enough. And what's the answer? That they cooked the oil together with the Ikarin. The question is that they would even just smear it, it would get fully absorbed. It's not enough. And in addition, Another question is, if it's not a question, however we're going to learn the opinion of Rabbi Meir, that there's no question that it's not even enough to smear without getting absorbed, so then why does Rashi present the opinion of Rabbi Huda starting off with his question on Rabbi Meir? If Rashi is learning and understands Rabbi Meir in such a way that this is not a question, so why is he presenting the opinion of Rabbi Huda starting with a question that he holds is not even a question? He should just present the opinion of Rabbi Huda. He should tell us how Rabbi Meir holds the Shem and Amish was made, and how Rabbi Yehuda holds it was made without the question, which we're going to have to explain in such a way, the opinion of Rabbi Meir, that this is not a question on him. So don't bring the question, that's not a question. So now we're going to go straight into answering the questions, and we're going to begin by answering the main question, the final question that we asked. And once we answer that, we're going to see how all the other questions are also going to be answered. So the explanation in this is as follows. According to Rabbi Meir, that they were shaylik, which means they cooked really well, the current and the oil, so there's no question at all of vali lasachasei kern any sipik. There's no oil over here, it's going to get all absorbed. Because it doesn't matter at all that through the shlika the oil became absorbed in the Ikarin. It doesn't matter. That's totally fine. Because Rabbi Meir holds that the Shem and Mishka doesn't have to be oil for itself. That's not what the Shem and Mishka is. But rather it may be together with the Ikarim, which the Ikarim became dissolved and turned into a liquid. So Rabbi Meir holds that it did get absorbed and they cooked it really well to the extent, like we'll see Rashi says, that everything melted, it turned into a liquid and that's the Shem and Mishka. And even though it's called Shem and Hamishcha, it says Shem on it, and it says about it, V'yitzakta and V'yizesa, and it's talking all about the Shem and Hamishcha. Nevertheless, since they were Shailik the Yikarin, they cooked really well, the, the Yikarin, which, like we said, Shailik is more than Bishel. They cooked it and overcooked it. So it's understood that they no longer looked like Yikarin, but rather, as in the words of Rashi, they were Nemeichen like a liquid. 
So according to Rabbi Meir, there's no question that they got absorbed. They did get absorbed and they cooked it so well that all of it turned into a liquid and that was the Shemana Mishcha. And so there's no question on Rabbi Meir that it got absorbed. It's fine that it got absorbed. However, Rabbi Huda doesn't want to learn this way since he holds that the Shemana Mishcha has to be, as it's called, Shemen, oil, and not mostly melted ikarim, which become into a liquid because we were shaylik them in oil. That's not what the Shemana Mishcha is. It's not mostly ikarim that turned into a liquid because they were cooked really, really well with the oil. And therefore he learns that what, what they did is shram b'mayim, they first soaked it in water so that they no longer would absorb. Then they put the oil there and the oil absorbed the scent of all the roots and spices and then they gather up the oil from on the roots. And this is also the reason, now we're going to answer the other part of the of the final question. We answered the first part. How is that not a question, Rabbi Meir? Because Rabbi Meir holds it's totally fine that it got absorbed. All of it turned into a new substance, a liquid substance, and that was the Shemana and Mishcha. The roots, the spices, the oil, everything together turned into a substance called the Shemana and Mishcha. Our other question was, then why does Rashi quote the question of Rabbi Huda if it's not a question on Rabbi Meir? So this is also the reason why Rashi quotes the question of Rabbi Huda and he's medayik to say, It's not even enough to smear the oil on the roots. Even though, really what happens when they smear it, the oil gets absorbed and is not, it's not used to smear the ikarim. If you're going to smear it, it's going to get absorbed in the ikarim. And so if it's going to get absorbed, it's not seen at all. And so Rabbi Huda should have asked, how can it be called oil? It's not even oil. It gets fully absorbed. There's no oil there. Why does Rashi say, Because Lasuch emphasizes that the item used to smear onto another substance is secondary. You're smearing the main thing with this. So the thing that you're smearing onto the item is secondary to that item. And so it certainly cannot be called by the secondary item. So that's the point of Rabbi Huda's question. He's not asking that there's no oil here. There is oil, because the whole thing turned into oil. But his difficulty is you can't call this Shemana Mishcha, because if it's being used to smear, then it's the secondary item. A secondary item is not going to be given the name of the whole thing. And so now we understand why there's no question on Rabbi Meir. And now the question of Rabbi Huda is not that there's no oil here. His question is that you can't call it Shemana HaMishcha if the shemen is secondary. It's only being used to smear onto the roots and spices. Now we're going to move on to answering question number two, which was, why does Rashi say, V'nech l'kubay, chach me'isrol, enat v'nech l'kubay, Rabbi Seinu? So the basis for the argument between Rabbi Meir and Rabbi Huda is because in the Pasuk it says, and we're going to read the Pasuk and explain it afterwards, So this means that there are two parts and stages. There is the Vasisa Oisei, the making of it, and then the result, what it should be. Yiyah, the beginning of the Pasuk says, Vasisa Eisei, how you should make it. And the end of the Pasuk says, Yiyah, what it should be, what should be the result. So there is at the time of making it, so then it has to be a mixture. As the Pasuk says, Vasisa Eisei, Shem en Mishchas Kodesh, Reikach Merkachas Maisei Rekeach. You should make it in what manner? Reikach Merkachas Maisei Rekeach. And as Rashi explains, V'chol Dover HaMa'erev B'chaveirei, any two things that are mixed together with one another. Atshazek HaYifeach Mizeh, till one absorbs on the other one. Whether it's scent or taste, that's what's called a merkachas. So at the time of making it, the Pasuk is telling us it has to be a mixture. And then there's another part, another stage, which is the result. After making it, it has to be shemen mishchas kodeshiyah. And Rabbi Meir and Rabbi Yehuda argue which detail has the greater emphasis. So let's start with Rabbi Meir. According to Rabbi Meir, that boy sholk was a karen, that they cooked really, really well the shemen and mishcha the shemen with the ikarin, so the making it with oil and merkachas, the making part, was fulfilled to the fullest extent. The fullest extent of mixing two things together is when they are cooked together, especially in a way of shalku. So therefore, Rabbi Meir holds that in order to fulfill the tzivoy of vasisa isa merkachas to the fullest extent, it has to be in a manner of boy shalku isa ikarin. We have to fulfill that part, the vasisa isa, to the fullest extent. Even though 
that as a result of this afterwards, it's lacking in fulfilling to the fullest extent that it should be Shemen Mishchas Kodeshiyah of oil on its own. It's just Shemen Mishchas Kodeshiyah. So Rabbi Meir holds that the main thing is the making of it. The result is not as important when we have to choose between the two of them. Now let's move on to Rabbi Hoda. So on the other hand, according to Rabbi Hoda, even though through his, his way, the way he says it was done, which is Shrom Bamaim Shaliv Yivlus Hashemen, they soaked it in water so that it should not absorb the oil. Then they placed the oil on it so it should absorb the scent. Then they gathered up the oil from upon the roots. So even though through that is the making it with oil only in a manner of Hetzif Kipchei, that they put it on and then took it off, and their makachas isn't fulfilled to the fullest extent, the mixture component is not there to the fullest extent, because they're not being mixed as much as by shalku. However, the result of it does fulfill to the fullest extent. It fulfills the shemen, mishras kodeshiyah, of oil on its own to the fullest extent. And Rebbe Huda says, the result is more important. If we have to choose, we're going to choose the result over the way that it's done. And since in the simple reading of the Pasuk, there's no proof for which of these factors outweighs the other. So therefore, Rashi begins by saying, They're two equal opinions. One's going to have better the Vasisa, and one's going to have better the Shemen Mishras Kedesh, the Yiyya. He says this in order to teach that both opinions are equal in the way of learning of Pshutish Mikra. Now, we're going to, in the next sections, we're going to actually answer why Rashi calls them Chachme Yisrael. So to address why it says Chachme Yisrael, so now, based on what we just said, we can also explain why Rashi says Chachme Yisrael. It's because these two opinions of Rabbi Meir and Rabbi Hudo, in the manner of how to make the Shemana Mishcha, they reflect two different approaches of how a Yid should go about fulfilling mitzvahs, like by, the, like by fulfilling the Tzivri of a Sisa Shemen. So it reflects two different approaches of how a Yid should go about fulfilling mitzvahs, and therefore, it's an argument of Chachme Yisrael, because Chachme Yisrael relate to how a Yid should fulfill mitzvahs. What are the two approaches? Is the primary thing to fulfill the mitzvah to the fullest extent possible in the present, even though it will be lacking later on? So does a person primarily occupy themselves with doing what they need to do now, and not considering how and what type of impact it's going to have later? Or is the primary thing that at its completion, the mitzvah is fulfilled to the fullest extent. Do we look at the end result, even if it will be achieved only if the present doing isn't fulfilled to the fullest extent? And there are different examples for this. One of them is about fasting on some gedalia, if it will cause a person not to be able to fast on Yom Kippur. Do we say that on some gedalia a person needs to fast, so that's what they should do, and not regard what will be later on? Or do we say, no, a person has to look at the end result, and the end result is that Yom Kippur is more important, it's Minat and so a person should not fast on some Gedalia so that they could fast on Yom Kippur. And similarly here, the Tzivi isn't written clearly in terms of how the Shemen HaMishcha should be made, but rather only in general, that it should be Vasisa, Merkachas, Shemen, Mishchas, Kodesh, It tells us that Vasisa has to be Merkachas. It also tells us that Yiyya has to be Shemen. And so it depends on the opinion of Chachme Yisrael on how to fulfill the mitzvahs. We'll start with Rabbi Meir. Rabbi Meir says that when the Yidin had to make the Shemen HaMishcha, they primarily concerned themselves with fulfilling it fully in the present. By the making of the Shemen HaMishcha, since the way to make it as a Merkachas, it, since the way to make it is as a Merkachas, that's how the Torah says to make it, so therefore, even though it would then be lacking in the result of being Shemen Mishchas Kedeshia, since the oil wouldn't be seen on its own, it doesn't matter. The main thing is how it's being done now. On the, then regarding Rabbi Huda, so on the other hand, Rabbi Huda says that the present has to be done in a way that it prepares for the future result being complete. Therefore, we can't say boy shalk was karin, because then it would be lacking in the shlemus in the com- being complete of the result of Shem and Mishchas Kedeshiyah. It's not going to be Shem and alone. So therefore, Rabbi Huda says, Shrom Bamayim, which even though then the Merkachas isn't complete, it's not as much of a mixture. Nevertheless, this brings the final result of Shemen to be complete, that it is in Shlemus. So that's why it says Chachme Yisrael, because this is something which is connected to Chachme Yisrael that instruct Yidin on how to fulfill mitzvahs. These are two approaches about how to go, how to go about fulfilling mitzvahs. When there is two possibilities, one that emphasizes the present and one that emphasizes the future or one that emphasizes the action and one that emphasizes the result.
Now we're going to move on to answering questions three and four, which asked about Rashi mentioning the names of Rabbi Meir and Rabbi Yehuda. And we're going to do it in two parts because it's long. So the first part is going to be very short and just generally answer the question, and then we're going to elaborate on it. According to this, it's also understood the reason that Rashi mentions the names of the Chachm Yisrael, and also the reason that he chooses Rabbi Meir and Rabbi Huda, and not like in the Bavli, Rabbi Huda and Rabbi Yesi. This is because Rashi, in an earlier teaching of his, presented an argument between Rabbi Meir and Rabbi Huda, where there too their argument is founded on the basis, on the same basis as their argument here. And like we actually see there as well, Rashi says, Nech chachme Yisrael, because it's the same type of argument that's related to Chachme Yisrael about how to do a mitzvah. So the reason why Rashi says the names, and he chooses specifically Rabbi Meir and Rabbi Huda, it's because he's telling us that it fits with their way of learning elsewhere, because we see an earlier Rashi, where as we're going to explain, he also brings Rabbi Meir and Rabbi Huda, and it's the same type of argument as over here. So now we're going to look at that other Rashi. Rashi writes in Pashas Mishpatim regarding the din of a seicher, a renter, somebody who rents an object to use it. He says, V'loi perish madine. The Torah doesn't tell us what is the din of a seicher. Im is it like a pay, an unpaid watchman who is only chayv in a case of pshi of negligence, a kishemer sacher? Or is it like a paid watchman who is also chayv if the item is lost or stolen for gneva and aveda? L'fichach nechluku b'yichach meisrael. Therefore, the chach meisrael argue, seicher, ketzad meshalem. How does a seicher pay? Rabbi Meir Aimer Kishemir Chinam. Rabbi Meir says it's like a Shemir Chinam, an unpaid watchman. And Rabbi Huda Aimer Kishemir Sacher. And Rabbi Huda says it's like a Shemir Sacher, a paid watchman. Now, simply the reasons are we'll start with Rabbi Huda. Rabbi Huda holds he's like a Shemir Sacher since he's using the animal. The Seicher gets to use the animal and benefit from it. So that's payment for watching it since he's using it. So in exchange, he has to give a better level of guarding, like a paid watchman. Now we'll see the opinion of Rabbi Meir. Rabbi Meir holds that since he's paying for the use, the Seicher is using it, but he's paying money. He's a renter. So he got the use, and in exchange, he's paying. So he's not getting any pay for the watching, and so therefore he's like a Shemir Chinam. So the way Rabbi Meir says, the Seicher gets use, and he pays for the use. So those are canceled out. So he's not getting any pay now, so that's why he's like an unpaid watchman. And the Chayir, it's difficult to understand the reason Rabbi Yehuda compares a Seicher to a Shemir Sacher. Let's look at it. The reason a Shemir Sacher is responsible by Gnev of Aveda, the reason he has a higher level of responsibility, is because he gets paid for guarding it. Meaning, what are we saying here? The owner pays him in order that he should guard it with a Shmira Ma'ula, a better level of guarding, that it's also secure from a Gnev of Aveda. And since the reason the owner gives the Sacher permission to use his ox, why is he letting him use the ox? It's not that he should guard it, but rather because of the payment he's receiving. So the interact the the transaction is occurring because the owner wants to get the money and the renter wants to use the item so if the reason he's giving it to the renter is in order to get the payment so if so why should the seicher be responsible to provide a shmira ma'ula of a shemir sacher when he's not receiving any payment for guarding it and the explanation is that the argument between Rabbi Meir and Rabbi Huda is based on their general argument of what we said earlier, of whether the present outweighs the future or the future outweighs the present. What is, what's, what's stronger? So if we say the owner is primarily focused on the present, that he wants to earn money by renting out the ox, he wants to make money, give his animal to, and get money in exchange. And he also wants the ox to be guarded. But the main thing is, that he wants the money, so then we say the owner is satisfied, not with a shmir ma'ula to guard from something that may happen in the future, that's not what he's satisfied with, but rather even with the level of guarding of a shemir chinam. And this is because also this level of guarding is currently and generally enough. And the risk that in the future there may occur a gnev of aveda, that's not going to stop him from renting out his ox and make money in the present. So the main thing is for the person is the present. And so the rent, the owner, who's mostly concerned with the present, cares to get the money and not so much about the shmir, which is a future thing that something may happen in the future. Therefore, according to Rabbi Meir, that the present outweighs the future, it should come out that the owner relies on the level of guarding of a shemir chinam.
However, according to Rabbi Yehuda, that the future outweighs the present, then so long as the owner isn't secure that the item will be guarded with a shmir mu'ullah, so that the item will be safe even in the future, so then he won't forgo that security even for the money that he receives in the present. Rabbi Yehuda says that the future outweighs the present. And so even though the owner obviously wants the present, he wants to make money, but nevertheless, he's not going to forgo the future. And since the seicher is not a shamer chinam, who's doing a favor without any personal benefit, the shamer chinam is the exception. He's doing a favor without any personal benefit. Since the seicher is not a shamer chinam, but is rather renting the item and using it, so therefore we accept that the owner expects they will guard it with a shmira ma'ullah. So we see again their same argument. Do we primarily look at the present and then the future about the level of guarding and what may potentially happen is secondary and he'll be satisfied with the guarding of a Hashem Echinim? Or do we say that the future is the main thing and the owner is only satisfied and he expects, and that's the understanding and the agreement, that the Seicher is going to watch it with a Shemir Mu'ula and so he's like a Shemir Sacher. And with that, we answered all of our questions. Now we're going to move on to a related point about this argument between Rabbi Meir and Rabbi Huda. To strengthen this idea that these arguments fit with the general approach of Rabbi Meir and Rabbi Huda, so we'll present another place where we find the same argument between Rabbi Meir and Rabbi Huda. The Mishnah says, the Mishnah teaches, at kama mezamnim at kezayis. And this is the opinion of Rabbi Meir, that in order to bench, you need a kezayis. Rabbi Huda, Imer, at kebetza. Rabbi Huda says, it has to be a kebetza. And the Gemara explains what's the argument. Bikrai pligi, they argue about a pasuk. Rabbi Meir savar, Rabbi Meir holds when it says v'achalta zu achila, v'savata so zu shsiya. V'achalta is one thing, v'savata is something else. V'achalta is eating and v'savata is drinking. V'achila bekezayis, achila is always with a kezayis. Very good. The savar no, v'achalta v'savata are together. It means achila sheyesh basviya. What type of achila? One that brings to sviya. Ve'ezuzu. What type is that? That's kebetsa. It has to be a kebetsa. However, even though it seems like they argue about a pasuk, like the Gemara says, Taisus explains that these psukim are only in asmachta. It's an asmachta. It's really the discussion is really midrabana, and then they're bringing this these psukim as an asmachta. And midraisa requires sviya gemura. Everybody agrees minatera. There has to be sviya gemura. Complete satisfaction it has to be kebetsa. And so based on that, we must say that the basis for the argument, how to learn the Pasuk, in other words, they're arguing really Medir and they're just afterwards interpreting the Pasuk to fit as an Asmachta. So we have to say that the basis for the argument, how to learn the Pasuk, results from their difference in perspective. Start with Rabbi Meir. According to Rabbi Meir, that we focus on the present, it should come out that once there exists an Achila, then right away there should be a Chi of Zimun. If you have an Achila, that's in the present. We look at the present. There's a Chi of Zimun. And since the shear of an Achila is a Kazayas, so we must learn with an Asmachta, that's the secondary thing. How are we going to learn it? How are we going to explain the Asmachta? That the Achalta is its own thing right away at the time of eating. And so the person is Chayev in a Zimun with a Kazayas. Moving on to Rabbi Yehuda. So on the other hand, according to Rabbi Yehuda, we need to consider the future. We don't look at the present. Oh, do we have an Achila now? We have to look at the future, the result. Therefore, the Achila in the present doesn't outweigh the result of the Achila in the future. The purpose of eating, what's the whole purpose of Achila? Is to be satisfied. And therefore, that's what brings the Chi of, of Uvei Rachta. So again, we see this idea. Do we look at the present and say, in the present we have an Achila of a, when it's a Kazais. So a Kazais is enough. Or do we look at the future and say the purpose of Achila is Vesavata. So we have to have that. We have to have the Kabetza, which brings about the Vesavata. So again, we see this argument of Rabbi Meir and Rabbi Hidda playing itself out in another place. Now, to complete this idea even further, we spoke many times that when we find an argument between Tanayim about the same central idea, and we find it in a few areas, so we must say that each one of the arguments is needed and has a chiddush, meaning that in each of these places, there is room to distinguish and say that here they don't follow their general approach and opinion, and therefore the argument has to be repeated in each place. If it's really the same exact argument in every detail, there's no need to repeat it. The fact that it's repeated indicates that there's a possibility to say and argue that over here the argument won't apply. 
And so how are we going to apply that over here to the three different arguments by the Shem and HaMishcha, by the Seicher, and by the Zimun? So by the Shem and HaMishcha, since making the Shem and HaMishcha is a tzivri from Hashem, that by Hashem, it's, we say that it's, it's the past, present, and future as one. So the future is already here in the present. And this is especially according to the Tesefta and the way that the Raghav explains it, that the, by Hashem, the time is in such a way that you can't even separate it into different, different, uh, different parts. It's a, it's a point. It's a nakuda. It cannot be at all divided in any way. So it's all together. And so we would say maybe that we have to consider the future because it's not really the future. It's the present. And even though it involves the fulfillment by a yid, that by the yid it's not past, present, and future as one, but still it's a tzivay from Hashem. So there's place to say, there's room to argue that over here, Rabbi Meir will agree that we have to look at the future. Now by the Seicher. So by the Seicher, there's no certainty that there will be a Gnev of Aveda in the future. And especially since he's guarding it. The whole thing of the future is a, something which may possibly happen. So it's only a, it's only a distant possibility. Unlike by the Shem and Amishcha and Azimun, it's not a possibility. It's a certainty that if it's made in one way, the Shem and Amishcha, it'll come out one way. If it's made differently, it'll come out differently. Also the Zimun, there's a certainty how the person will feel after eating. And therefore, since over here there's no certainty, and it's actually a distant possibility that there will be a Gneva and a Veda, so therefore there's place to say that we should only consider the present, because the future is not really such a strong future. And this is even more so by the Seicher, this, take this point even more, why we shouldn't consider the future. The future Gneva and Veda and the current renting are two different things. There's two different things over here. One is that there's a rental that occurred, and the other... Th- thing that there is, is the possibility of the item being stolen. By the Shaman HaMishcha, it's one thing. You make it, how it's going to end up. By the Zimun, you eat, how you're going to feel. But by the renting, there's two different things. One is a, an event of a rental, and then it gets completed. And then there may be another event, but it's a whole separate event, that the item will be lost or stolen. And now moving on to the Zimun. If it only stated their argument by a Zimun, if that's all, the only place it said it, so we wouldn't know about the other cases. Because here the question is, what is the definition of Achila? No, 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 what is Achila? And so we, can't, so we can say it doesn't even relate to this whole discussion of present versus future. And so therefore, we have to have the argument in all three of the places in order to, to know that the argument exists by them.